So I think there's a lot of um, synergy with uh, the first session's um, overview, and I think you'll see a lot of themes that are the same, and I think that's good that we're all sort of thinking the same way. So Cher and I were tasked with the breakout session on clinical genome sequencing at scale. I should mention that we conducted a little survey of five questions um, a couple weeks before our session to get a sense of where people's initial priorities were coming in, and I think that underlies the first goal, and we have about six goals that we articulated after this breakout. Um, and if you look at the survey, we, were, we asked people to rank um, NHGRI's priorities, or where NHGRI should prioritize areas, um, across four different domains, interpretation, support for interpretation of genomes, uh, the functional understanding of genomic variation, uh, bioinformatic tools for sequence analysis, and technology development. And you'll see that the majority of people thought that the higher area of priority was in the interpretation realm. Although I think one of the things, as Sharon and I read some of the free text comments on the technology side, was that there was a clear dichotomy of opinions in whether the commercial sector was sufficient to drive technology innovation versus there needed to be continued an investment in this area. And I think there were complete ends of the spectrum there, and we did talk a little bit about it in the breakout session itself, and I think the, the over, the, and uh, feeling was that there was still a need for NHGRI to focus on improving technical sequencing platforms, that it wasn't just going to be solved in the commercial sector. Um, and a few sort of tactical goals below this overall is obviously focusing on improving accuracy, decreasing um, cost and turnaround time. Um, the one I underlined, I think, is the critical one, that we really need to detect all types of clinically relevant variation in a single genome scale test, which really can't be done today. So I think that's one of the most critical items, but also the last bullet really increasing the spectrum of tissues undergoing clinical sequencing, including analysis of circulating in single cells. Um, I think. In most of these areas, a lot of competition in both the academic and commercial sectors will drive this, but I think there's a couple of items here where uh, competition isn't necessarily the best approach, and that is really in the second and third bullets, thinking about standards. And the, the you know, discussion earlier about the Global Alliance is you know, one mechanism to help coalesce standards around the international community, I think, is, is certainly something to, for us to uh, participate in and think about. We also felt that harmonizing the technical aspects of research and clinical sequencing, perhaps not when innovating on technology, but when doing it at scale for research studies, if we could harmonize research and clinical approaches, it would be easier to pull research studies into clinical analysis and vice versa. So that was you know, one comment that was made and I think echoed. Um, the second goal was um, to focus on improving our understanding of variant and gene disease relationships gathering data from multi-ethnic populations with geographical diversity. I think this is an area where leveraging other omics is critical in terms of thinking about uh, how um, both RNA sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics might help inform genomic variation and its role in pathogenicity. Um, I think a critical element is being able to leverage the large amount of accumulating clinical sequencing data for research use. There's a lot of data out there and it's not being captured effectively. And I think this whole area really requires a laboratory physician and patient participation in all aspects of the clinical genomics uh, enterprise. So a few more specific details related to the tactics for this, um, that prior goal number two. Um, Certainly developing robust approaches to determine the pathogenicity of variants, and I think that really highlights some of the, um, the second breakout group's um, talk in, in terms of different approaches for this. Number two is really related, and this is partly from my experience in the ClinGen project, trying to get data out of every corner of particularly clinical labs, where the infrastructure they have to capture and store and therefore share this data is really poor. And if we could focus on developing a distributable platform for both clinical laboratories as well as others for physicians to share uh, genotypes and phenotypes and clinically interpreted variants, it would be really uh, effective in harnessing a lot of the work that is ongoing uh, as well as the data that's out there. And we just need to make it really easy for labs and doctors to do this. 
And I think a third critical component, particularly in the deep phenotyping areas of discussion, is engaging the patient population, um, both improving their education of the importance of genomics and health, developing a multi-use longitudinal cohort of all patients undergoing clinical genome scale sequencing to enable both recontact and deeper phenotyping, and, and of course, targeted re-phenotyping based on the sequencing results. So that was, you know, some overview for our first goals. I'm going to turn it over to Sharon to talk about the subsequent ones. And I would just say the, the longitudinal cohort reflects back to the conversation that was had after Eric's talk of really trying to engage all patients, sequence whether they were sequenced because their doctor ordered it or as part of a, a clinical trial. So the last two goals have more to do with really um, issues related to clinical utility and clinical trials. So the third goal is to determine clinical utility, value, and cost effectiveness, and we talked a lot about those are all really different things, of genomic sequencing in a variety of medical settings. Uh, and that point will come up multiple times that we discussed that there really may be significant differences depending on the disease or health setting that you're investigating. Uh, and again, our theme about ensuring equitable access to genomic medicine across populations and healthcare settings, and we really felt this was a critical role for NHGRI. So with regard to tactics, uh, we really are going to need randomized trials of genome scale sequencing in a variety of medical settings. We've got to, but we have to really define, and, and um, one of the members of the breakout group, I forgot, used this term the evidence development paradigm. You know, we really need to think about what are adverse events, what are positive outcomes, as we do for any other clinical trial, uh, to actually demonstrate the clinical utility of testing. We're going to have to develop what are appropriate cost effectiveness and value trials when you're talking about genomic sequencing. Uh, and again, ensuring that participants in these studies are not just the early adapters of technology but actually reflect patients in healthcare systems across the United States. Um, and it's really going to be important to partner and also cost share, because clinical trials are very expensive, uh, with other NIH institutes to really select what's the most appropriate clinical setting, what really is the challenging disease where there's a lot of morbidity in the United States and for which genomics might be appropriate. And how do we design these trials? What measures have really been validated for that disease to show efficacy? And can we really show that genomic sequencing impacts efficacy in a rigorous fashion? Um, the last two goals have to do with really how do we, okay, so you do a big clinical trial, you show that there's utility, but how do you then implement it into clinical medicine? And that's actually probably, I forgot who in the group said we don't do that well for anything in medicine, so why should we be different? But, uh, which is true, but um, we talked about trying to identify efficient and effective methods for implementation of sequencing into routine medical practice. And these are just examples, um, developing clinical decision support tools for ordering and applying genomic information. There's a lot of data in physician education literature that it's best to teach the patient at the time, uh, the physician, I'm sorry, at the time they're thinking about ordering the test, not trying to teach them a year in advance. Uh, we really need improved methods, again, point of care education for physicians. Um, and we have to implement our experience with return of results, so we've now through CSER and the ROR consortium generated a lot of return of results data, but what does that look like when you're really going out into clinical practice and not in a clinical trial? Um, and related to that, we really think that NHGRI needs to think about how should we be doing implementation research uh, in genomic medicine. There are a lot of such studies out of the ELSI um, uh, portfolio of grants. But if we're really going to be doing genomic sequencing in clinical medicine, what's really the best way to study how to, best, how to most appropriately in, implement that across many different healthcare paradigms? We had a very interesting discussion, I think, uh, kicked off by Steve Jaffe talking about the children's oncology group and the, you know, really the huge impact of cooperative groups across many years and other disease paradigms. Uh, and so, uh, in terms of trying to summarize this, our overarching strategy was creating a learning health system for clinical genomics for patients, physicians, insurers, and regulators. 
Um, and one might want to consider as a very large term goal development of really a national cooperative group uh, for genomic medicine. Adam, your light's on, if one of you want to say yeah, no. No. Yeah. Yeah, and I forgot to mention I was at the group yesterday, but uh, I believe the emphasis on clinical trials might be a, a little bit less and if you think also about on uh, comparative effectiveness research done on observational studies, if the numbers are large enough, uh, because I think that's a trend that the learning healthcare systems are adopting right now and also a trend towards pragmatic trials so the cost is not as uh, high. Great comment, thank you. Yeah, David. <clears throat> so um, I think the goals that you've laid out for the field are, are, very, are, are very good and appropriate. I guess one of the questions I'm struggling with is what's the role of NHGRI? And so NHGRI funds research, right? And it's not clinical implementation and it's not regulation and it's not these other things. And so. Some of the things you talked about, it seems to me I can imagine how uh, NHGRI would fund a pilot that would move us towards something. But when you get to like clinical implementation, a lot of these are issues of regulation and reimbursement and, and incentives in the healthcare system. And I'm trying to figure out what's the role of a research institute with a limited budget in, in achieving those things. Well, I'll just comment then Heidi can. There was a lot of discussion, especially among many of us in the group who actively try to order genomic testing about the, and Gail may want to comment, who talked about this very eloquently, about the fact that if we don't start generating real data that this is useful, that there is utility in a clinical setting, we're never going to get to the regulators. Um, and that. Um, and that's why there was a lot of emphasis on really thinking, and, and perhaps as the prior comment said, more creative ways, and we didn't talk about study design, but of really developing studies that test when is a genome scale test really effective in clinical medicine. And I, I will also add that, you know, executing on clinical utility and, and even observational studies are not going to be effective if the results that we are returning are inconsistent and incorrect, right? right? So, and right now, as we have engaged, you know, in an early stage laboratory sharing data, it's become very clear that there is great discrepancy across what's being returned to patients, how that information is conveyed and how it's understood. And so, if we're really actually going to succeed in these clinical studies, we have to have a core component of the interpretive process be correct and consistent and accurate to what we understand. We need to drive further understanding. So, you know, I don't think that just letting the marketplace and the clinical and commercial sectors compete and do it all separately is going to actually advance us in critical ways. And I think NHGRI, by aggregating and developing standards in consistent ways and really cataloging the resources and the tools to be able to do this effectively, particularly the knowledge side of it, so that we're all using consistent knowledge to support the integration of clinical um, genomics, I think will then support the outcome studies that we need to achieve to show that this is, is useful or show in cases that it's not, but answer the questions. And I would say that I think we tried to put our slides in an order that go from things that are more really obviously what NHGRI thinks about doing in terms of improving the test and improving the sequencing to things that we would really like to push NHGRI to consider doing. And so that maybe, as you said, is not currently within their purview. Gail? So you know, our goal is the National Institute of Health. We are trying to improve outcomes for patients. And we can do a lot of basic science, but if we don't get that into the clinic, we have fundamentally failed at our major goal, which is to improve health outcomes. From my standpoint, I negotiate with healthcare systems. I'm talking to University of Washington, I'm talking to Group Health, and trying to convince them to implement genomics in a way that isn't one-off. And they say, where is the data? And to answer that, we've been doing cost modeling, we've been doing some other outcomes research, but fundamentally, they're not going to make these changes until they see that there is some utility, not just to save money, because that isn't actually the overall goal of the health system, but to improve health. 
right? And so we have to show them that using genomics in medicine improves the health of some patients. Which patients? Eric? I, I share the passion for ensuring that, that this gets out to patients. But the conversation begins to worry me a little bit because you could say the same thing for drugs that, you know, until you can show the efficacy of drugs, you know, they're not going to get adopted by the healthcare system and many other things. And yet, on the research end, the NIH doesn't generate most of those data. They get generated by the sponsors who bring them to the FDA and bring them to the payers. And we have a system where those who would provide that to patients generate that and pay for it because they, in fact, will be reimbursed. It's possible to, to burn a huge amount of money demonstrating pharmacoeconomics or the economics of this. So I, I agree, but I want to, I mean, I, I, we need to be doing okay. some of it, but I'm worried that, that if we take it upon ourselves to generate the whole economic and efficacy argument, we'll burn the NIH budget doing it. So but, but we have Eric, to have some Eric, line there. Eric, could I ask you one question about your model? Unless we're going back to patenting genes, right? Who, who's the payer then, right? Well, the payer <laughs> is clear. The payer is going to be uh, the insurance companies and CMS. No, I don't mean no, that. They're not going to pay for no. Who's the sponsor? Who's going to sponsor this? Who's going to sponsor yeah. this? Yeah. Well, the question becomes post-gene patenting. I'm very happy about we're in the post-gene patenting era. What's the business model? Right. So there are very effective business models in diagnostics without patents around the analyte. We have large companies, lab cores, quests, whatever, that do it by virtue of lines of distributions, connections to hospitals. There is going to be a shift in the business model, and it's not going to be around the patent on the analyte. It'll be on some package of services, some lines of distributions, probably larger organizations. I don't think yeah, I, we I, are I, going to replace the need for an economic model for diagnostics. No, I, I guess what I'm saying is, at least up until now, those groups have made no effort, none that I'm aware of, to sponsor this type of effectiveness research. So I agree. And <laughs> I think if, you were, if we're saying, how do we drive the creation of effectiveness research? I agree. How do we do some models of effectiveness research? I agree. I'm just, and I didn't, I didn't mean to suggest that the suggestion was that we go all the way, but I want to note, we do not have the critical mass to do all that effectiveness research, so we can be catalytic and should be catalytic and set the bar, but we've got to actually have an ecosystem out there that's going to drive an awful lot of that. that, that that's all. Well, and I, I mean, I agree with you, and I think one of the reasons we emphasize the need for harnessing all of the data that's already being generated and paid for by mm -hmm insurers and the healthcare systems is because we can't take on the entire cost, but we have to do it in a coordinated way and we have to be able to harness that data for multiple uses to, you know, understand whether different paradigms are, have evidence so, or outcomes. And, and to the point Eric Green raised earlier about are there fellow travelers who might bear some costs in this, I think this is a great case where insurers, both CMS itself and others, and maybe PCORI, ought to be picking up a lot of this. And NHGRI ought to be the tip of the spear organizing these studies. Right. But we ought to be figuring out how others are really yes. providing the, the financial fuel for those Absolutely. studies. Right. right. And that was, we were trying to make the point about partnering with institutes, but we didn't talk about other other sources. It, it, Jim it, and, um, and Richard Ken. and you. And yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with Eric that it makes me nervous, right, when we start talking about this. But I, I don't think we can avoid talking about it because ultimately, like Gail says, this is the, the end goal, right? And, and to me, what we have to do is partner, right? And it's not going to be LabCorp, it's not going to be GDX who pays for it, but it, we're going to have to pick and choose and be very careful about how we do this. And, and the beauty of it, I think, is that um, I know that I don't know much about outcomes research, but what I've also learned from working with people who do know a lot about it, they don't know anything about genomics. Right. So it's a, it's a really right. good partnership that we need, right. that, that NHGRI needs to, to kind of facilitate. Ken? Yeah. Yep, just to emphasize that point, some of us sit in other roles, and, and um, uh, as you know, Moon Curry's been at this for some time, and we've been working uh, 
until the funding went down through the CDC program, but it looks like some of that funding may come back. But just to under, first to say, I really think this is great what you've come up with, the translational um, uh, effectiveness stuff uh, can, can clearly be co-sponsored. Um, PCORI, Eric mentioned quickly, is a huge funding resource, and then these, this EGAP initiative, um, knowledge synthesis wor uh, workshops are, are there. So I think we don't, NHGRI doesn't need to bear the bulk of the burden, but absolutely should uh, work with the other institutes to do that. Yes. Um, one thing I might also add is when you think about what we saw yesterday related to gene therapy trials that are already ongoing, and some, you know, more than 8% of those are monogenic diseases that have been genomically characterized, and to me that seems like that's genomic clinical genomic medicine already happening, that if you can tie some of that to knowledge around costs and cost effectiveness, you really have a good case for, you know, where does genomic medicine really make um, a business value, uh, a patient value, and physicians. Thank you. Robert, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of in initiatives in medicine did diffuse out into medicine. I'm thinking about coronary artery bypass surgery, lots of technologies before they demonstrated some sort of cost effectiveness. And I'm afraid that that's sort of out of the bag. It's going to be happening here. So I think we just need to be careful. We're not trying to say, you know, genomic medicine can't happen right. until right. we Absolutely. demonstrate this. I, I think that would be counterproductive. But I do think that Right, and I would just say that was not right. our intent at all, and that's why we talked about there is a lot of sequencing going on and we need to harness that information. Right, and so I think that's a great idea. I also think that somewhere between the sort of harnessing in centralized or federated fashion, um, there is a danger of premature consensus. Uh, I like that phrase that Maynard used before, in the clinical realm, because we really don't ha know how these can be modeled and, and utilized. So I think NHGRI can play a role in permitting and encouraging experiments in clinical utility, even absent large-scale downstream proof at this moment in history that that clinical utility is somehow cost-effective. And then the larger marketplace can take these experiments and try to work them through. So, for example, I'm just talking about different Several of us are already doing randomized clinical trials in CSER. We do have outcomes teams associated with some of those CSER grants. But some of the things I'm curious about are sentinel studies. Just like Rick had suggested, you have protein categories. You can have categories of trials in particular types of genomic information that stand in for the rest of them. So you don't have to do thousands and thousands of trials about thousands and thousands of genes. I mentioned N of 1 studies uh, yesterday. And then clever ways to do longitudinal um, outcomes trials. All of these can be supported from a methodological point of view by NHGRI without having to take on the societal role of regulation. I, I would agree. I, I would just argue that I think we do also have to learn from our colleagues. And if we're going to do trials, we need to define what outcomes are. We need to define Absolutely. We need to define adverse events. I mean, I, I, if you really think about this Caesar paradigm, and I'm one of them, Few of us really are agreeing on even definitions of what is an adverse event. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that, as genomicists, we really need to start defining so that if another group or institute is doing a genomic-based trial, we have some definitions, we've had some experience with how to do that. And I think we also need to define how to aggregate because there will never be a trial for every rare disease or every ge right. gene. And so figuring out ways that we can aggregate when we're looking at cost effectiveness and utility across, you know, groups of areas, rare disease diagnostics as a group and, and right. things like that. And I think having a discussion about how do we aggregate different elements of the clinical sort of utility analysis spectrum would be useful for us. Mike. Yeah, I, d I don't know if you got this granular, but if you broke into, you know, diagnosing and treating disease per se versus sort of prediction aspects, which is in some respects more futuristic, but in other yeah. respect it's very front and center in the mainstream population. And, and so the considerations aren't exactly the same, I guess, and so I didn't know if you broke it right. down. I, I think the, the main reason we were saying in a variety of medical settings is for exactly that reason. We did have a very lively discussion about 
putting the money into sequencing uh, people at birth and seeing how the data is used over time. Um, there were real supporters and non-supporters of that idea, but uh, clearly there's a whole different design for prediction um, and, and would require a very different kind of, of study. And I, and I think, you know, utilizing these large-scale patient cohorts ascertained by genotype, not by phenotype, will help inform the predictive nature of genetics and, pe you know, penetrance values and things like that, that I think will then feed into the, to our ability to do predictive medicine as we understand the full spectrum of, of how gen genomics influences the development of traits. Eric? So Following up on Mike's comments, did your committee discuss the role of healthy genomes? It seems more and more of this is going to be driven by the population, the individuals, and less from originating from the physician. And I think that was this element of critically engaging the, um, the uh, patients in longitudinal registries. There are many healthy genomes already out there, and there will be an increasing number, and if we can um, engage those patients and their genomes and longitudinal phenotyping and we're, you know we're developing a registry there's other registries out there and i think that will become a critical element right. i mean i think a relatively short-term goal is this idea of trying to engage the population that if you had an exome or genome ordered for any reason that you agree to join a cohort because even the term healthy Genomes, which I always find kind of funny, I was one of those, I was in a healthy genome stu study. I have multiple chronic conditions. I mean, I'm up here, so I guess I'm healthy, but you know, so mm -hmm. even the definition, even the definition of even getting real data on people who had healthy genomes done will provide us a lot of information. But I do think it, it, really there was a lot of concordance around the idea that we need to be capturing all the data we can from individuals who've had their genomes or exomes done for clinical or, you know, or, per, or for whatever purpose um, so that that data is not wasted. Debbie. So I just want to say in bringing up this idea of, of genomics and health and people getting their genomes, how diverse are those genomes? They're not. So at we all. need to push projects also that actually uh, bring genomics into diverse populations through I, I totally a variety agree. of yeah. <laughs> are we Well I yeah. think they had I mean if, if I, I one, sorry, heard sorry, this, this has to be the last the last question because we have to move on. Yep. No, I mean, I, I just adding my voice to the chorus. I mean, I, but I think you guys had that on there. Is that it, in fact the the whole notion of equity in genomics research is one that um, is it, totally worth you know sort of thinking about, particularly in this context and 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 implementation, and in, in particular in reimbursement, where you can imagine different populations are going to be hit quite differentially. But. Yes. Next up, Andy and Evan. <laughs> 